I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my everyday life living in Latin America. And there has been a lot of market volatility recently in the U.S. and world stock markets. And there has been some ups and importantly downs. And when there are big downs, that means without any doubt, the gold sellers are going to be out trying to make a quick buck off of your panic. And you need to be wary of what this means. So let's hit that bump. It is a common mantra to claim that gold is a safe harbor that you can go to in times of trouble. And to be sure, gold does not have a lot of volatility, so it is easy to use gold as a hedge in times when things are fluctuating and you can't predict what's going to happen. If you're trying to avoid playing the market, gold is generally a relatively stable place to hold your money. It is essentially a currency with a low volatility rate while things play out, but long term, Anything that is a currency is an incredibly foolish move and should, by the nature of knowing what it is, a commodity and a currency, that alone tells you that anyone who says it is a safe place to put your money is lying. There is no possibility of currency being good to hold your money. It can be good for temporary transactions. It can be good for riding out some volatility that you can't predict. It will never have been the right choice, but you can't always predict what the right choice is, so it can protect you against that. There are reasons that gold would be used as a financial investor to try to protect yourself. But when market volatility comes, when we have major problems in the market, the first thing that people do who have gold is try to convince you that you need to buy gold. Why do they do this because they see it as an opportunity to inflate its value and try to get out of their gold positions that they are currently stuck in. This is common, right? And so a lot of people get duped into this because gold sounds reasonable. We hear it so much that it's hard to believe that gold isn't actually very useful, but it's actually not. Not in the big scheme of things. You need to be a market expert to be able to use quirky vehicles like gold. Normal people cannot use gold to their advantage. They cannot do it. It is too dangerous. Now, the reason that gold is super confusing is because, one, people just don't understand money and markets and investing. That's the first thing. Anytime you have investing, you have the opportunity to take advantage of people because very few people ever learn how to judge these things. They just hear scary things in the news and gold doesn't sound scary. Gold sounds like it's just a metal. It can't take advantage of you, but it's just a commodity. So like any market, the thing you're buying isn't the thing that takes advantage of you. It's the people who sell it to you. And gold has some of the worst of people trying to sell it to you. Now, the first thing is for a long time, gold had a controlled price. So we have no way to know what the value of gold was over time because it was controlled by governments up until roughly Bretton Woods. So any numbers we have from before that time are completely fake and we have to ignore them. After Bretton Woods, we had some market volatility as people tried to figure out what gold was worth. And quite honestly, we're still in that period of volatility. In reality, the gold as a floating currency is only so much older than Bitcoin at this point. So when we talk about Bitcoin and its wild volatility and why we don't know what it's going to do, we're kind of in the same position with gold. It's relatively unpredictable because it's literally a new currency as it was kept from the public as a currency for a long time. We can go into long discussion some other time about why it was not a floating currency when it was used for the gold back standard. Before anyone says, oh, but they're going to return to that, that is a lie. No one, no rational economic, uh, economist in the world would ever suggest such a thing. No country is, is considering such a crazy thing. That is absolutely ridiculous. It's so implausible. It's so absurd to try to suggest that there's going to be a gold standard, that you should instantly, if you hear someone say, oh, they're going to a gold standard, you instantly should say, <laughs> clearly this person doesn't understand currency or markets or history or politics. None of that. None of that would allow that to happen. That is such an outrageously bad idea for everyone. There's no one who would benefit from that, and certainly not any country that tried to do that. It's a guaranteed destruction of their economy, and that is why every country that ever experimented with it rapidly fled that crazy idea. It is so bonkers nutso.
to think that gold-backed currency could ever be a good idea. And at the time that countries experimented with it, it was generally known to be a really bad idea. We already had gone through massive gold inflation and deflation prior to the gold-backed standards and knew that it was, it was a bad idea. We got the idea of it because they used to actually use gold coins. That's a little bit different. Still a bad idea. We moved away from that for a reason. And we're not going to go back to it. No one's going to go back to it, period. It doesn't matter if it's the end of civilization. It doesn't matter if people stop being educated. It doesn't matter if, if you know, the dollar collapses. None of those things lead to, let's make this incredibly stupid mistake again, right? That's not going to happen. No one who has enough money and is no one's in a position to lead governments is so uneducated in currency to make that mistake. It's just absurd. So don't let anyone suggest that to you. Immediately shut someone off. If they say that, just go, well, <laughs> this is not an honest conversation. You've been either duped or you're trying to dupe me. In either case, you're not prepared to have a real conversation about currency. That's a separate thing. But as far as a, a actual commodity in which you can invest, gold is okay, but it's volatile. After Bretton Woods, we had a little bit of spikes. In 1980, which was not that long after Bretton Woods, well, 1979, really, we had an amazing spike in gold. And this is super important, as at that point, people believed gold was going to go up and up. This is where the idea that gold had a huge amount of value came from. If you were to have bought anywhere in the 1978 to 1982 range, you, or in 1981, really, you would be, even today, right now, this is important, gold is at a current spike. It is at a high. So what we always say, everyone says, buy low, sell high. Gold is currently at a high, at a massive inflated peak. So you got to be super careful. If you buy now, you're essentially guaranteed to lose money on gold. Gold is not a stock. It doesn't have dividends. It is not a value product that makes money. It only has value in for what you can sell it for, minus whatever losses you have from the cost of trades, the effort of trades, the taxes on trades. And gold really generally can't move between countries without huge overhead. So you really are trapped within an economy when you buy gold. And that's one of the reasons why economists like you to think buying gold is a good idea, because it traps money within whatever economy you're already in. So if you're an American economist, Economist, you want people to think buying gold is a good idea because it means their money can't leave the United States. And that leaves it for the wealthy, intelligent investors to have the flexibility of working in international markets. If you were to have bought gold in 1979 to 1981, at no point since that time could you have pulled out your money. At some times, you would have had it worth only 20% of what you paid for, right? At its peak, now, this is a small spike, but at its peak, it was uh, in inf adjusted for inflation, which is the only way to look at it, about $2,800 per ounce. And then by 2001, remember, people say gold just goes up and up. You can't lose money on gold. It will always make money. Until 2001, with only the tiniest little bit of variation month to month, it essentially dropped precipitously to under $500, about $490. $2,800 to $490. For every ounce of gold that you had invested, you would lose $2,300 in today's money. For every, if you bought 10 ounces, $23,000 lost. After having held it for 22 years. 22 years of losing money. This is not stocks. If you would have lost the same value in stocks during that time where the market cap dropped by 80 plus percent over a period of 21, 22 years, you would still have had dividends paying you during that time. You may still have a winning stock and you could potentially hold on to it for indefinite amount of time in the future and continue to make money and hope that the market cap comes back so you have an option to get out of it. But it doesn't matter with stocks because you may not have bought them for the purpose of selling them, but gold's only purpose is to sell it. If you don't sell gold, it's lost, right? Now you can pass it on to a next generation, but gold's only value is in the buying and selling, whereas it's because it's a commodity, it only has value in the trade. But a stock has value by existing. So it's a completely different animal. So when people compare it, they try to look at only the ancillary cap market cap value of a stock and try to show that gold competes against that, but that's not the value of stocks. That is an ancillary side effect of stocks. Now, gold did rebound. If you were to hold on to it for another decade, 
by 2011, it came back to about $2,500 for a brief moment. Again, another panic brought it back up. So if you had held for 32 years, you still would have lost money. Just hard money. 32 years. Storing your money somewhere, at least you wouldn't have lost as much. That is quite a loss to take. But you only had several months to recover that before it dropped again and went below $1,500. It didn't come back up until a serious spike until 2019. Another brief spike went back down, but not as far in 2022. And now we are back to a spike a little bit higher than 2019, but not as high as 2011. So if you'd have invested in 1979, 1980, 1981, or in 2011, you would have bought higher than you have been able to sell at any time since. This would have been guaranteed loss all those times. At the current spike that we have now, only in those two moments over the last hundred years could you have made money on gold. So buying today, for all intents and purposes, is a guaranteed loss. I'm going to show the charts. There is no way to make money by buying gold today. That is so foolish, so reckless, so completely insane to think that you could. Now, if you're going to buy it today and you're going to hold on to it for like 24 hours, sure, that's a reasonable, you could estimate that we're within a one to two day or even a few week moment of inflation due to panic, due to market volatility, and people are just willing to throw lots of money into gold and think they can get out of it. But that's not going to last. You know it's not going to last. Likely gold will return to its more or less baseline of around $780. Well, I guess it's a little bit higher, about $800. Uh, but we don't know where the exact baseline is because gold is too young as a currency. It is still volatile. But the point being, when people say gold just increases, no, gold decreases. Gold has no history of increasing. It has a history of volatility, but when it was first released from Bretton Woods, it went to a spike, and since then has been dropping. Now, there has been a period since, make sure I get these dates right, about 2008, in which it has not dropped below a certain baseline, but we've had a lot of market volatility, and people have been panicky. And so people are still in a gold bubble for the last 16 years, and it's worth understanding that in the long run, we expect this to simply be a bubble, and anything purchased since 2008 has relatively little possibility of being able to hold its value over the long haul. We expect that to come down. And we're going to look at silver for the same thing. Now, silver also had some controlled prices through quite a bit of time and then became more volatile, but was not as controlled as gold. With silver, we have a bit more of a baseline of where it hovers around 20, somewhere between 10 and $22 Per ounce. Now, similarly, in 1980, we had a spike to where it went to about $145. That is a lot from a base of just below 20. Um, it then returned and actually went all the way back down to around 10 for a really long time. We're talking about nearly the entire history of silver is that it's hovering be way below the $20 mark. Now, around 2006, so pretty close to where gold started getting a little bit more active, we see the base come up on this. Now, remember, this is adjusted for inflation. So these are real numbers. This is not, well, money was worthless back then. No, no, no. This is a completely adjusted chart. So you can't use that kind of thinking. You have to, this is the actual value of silver changing over time. And so we see after 2006, we see an inflation. We see one spike in 2011, but nowhere close to where we got in, in 1980, right? Not even a, a little bit. It was below 70. It was like $68 for one month. And then it fell right back down to in the, in the 50s and then immediately into the 40s and then into the 20s again. Right now, very tiny spike. Again, we're in a very volatile time. People are panicking. Money is going crazy places. This is how, if you are the rich, if we were to think of the world in tiers, where the rich want to keep the rich rich and the poor are willing to be poor, then the thing that will happen, and this, this is not a concerted effort as people like to pretend, but there is a certain amount of the rich teach their children how to stay rich and the poor teach their children to be reckless and emotional. And they justify it and say, no one can tell me what to do. Just because I'm poor doesn't make you smarter than me. There's lots of things that are said to justify empowering the poor to stay poor. And the rich at some point give up and say, look, we tried to tell people, right? But they don't listen. People like to react emotionally. They get angry when you try to tell them that's not logical. But this is a financial market. You will always be punished. The biggest thing, logic is rewarded. Emotions are punished. 
So if we look at the way that the rich would think in this one isolated space, stocks make money. Stocks have growth over time, always. Not every stock, but on average, the market goes up. It creates more value. Gold, silver, they're commodities. They can't create value. They are steady state. There are big periods of time where they may go up or down because people are interested in them, lose interest in them, emotionally tied, panicky about stocks, feel that the world is confusing, feel like metals are less confusing, even though in reality, people are way more confused by metals than they are by stocks. Stocks are pretty straightforward. People understand that they're buying part of a company. When people buy gold and silver, they start to imagine that they're buying magic powder and they think it's going to create more value, which it can't do. It's so obvious that these things cannot happen and yet people imagine that they do. And we know that there is a finite amount of these materials, yet we also know that people are figuring out how to pull them out of deeper mines. People are figuring out how to pull bold shipwrecks. People are figuring out how to pull them out of ocean water. People are trying to figure out how to grab passing by asteroids and add to the system. If these things happen, you can have massive fluctuations, but the expectation is those fluctuations will always be down. As more metal is added to the system, the value of everything decreases. Of course, if you pull an asteroid made of gold out of space, you will be rich because you have this huge asteroid of gold. Even if the gold is only worth 10% what it was before you pulled that asteroid, that's still a lot of money. It's not that it's not a lot of money, but if everyone who holds gold suddenly has only 10% of the gold they have, you've lost a lot of money, right? It doesn't matter how much. So if you're the rich, you want to keep the prices of stocks low so that you can buy more of them because the dividends aren't going to change based on the market cap of the stocks. And you want commodities like gold and silver to be high. And you want the poor to be pouring money, not into the stock market and inflating those prices, but into other things that really can be controlled by large amounts of stock movement. So in this, it allows the rich to move money from the poor who constantly buy high, sell low, rush to bad investments. When the market goes down, gold shoots up. Everyone rushes to buy gold because they're afraid of the market. And so they do exactly the wrong thing. They sell their stocks when they're low and they buy gold when it's high. While the rich who are being logical and have people to protect them, even if you're an emotional rich person, chances are you've hired someone who says, I'm not even going to show you the market if you're that emotional. I'm just going to take care of it for you and make you lots more money. And I'll make some money off of the top because you're rich and you can pay me to protect you. And everyone's happy. We call them hedge fund managers. And so they don't let you act emotionally. They say, nope, stop. I got this. We're going to buy high we're going to buy low and sell high, not inverse. But the poor will always act emotionally and say, yes, I understand that we were taught buy low, sell high, but I'm panicking and you can't tell me not to panic. So I'm going to do exactly the wrong thing. And then later say the system was rigged, even though I was told what to do and did the opposite and then had exactly what I should have predicted would happen because it was a guaranteed based on my results. Once people start justifying reacting emotionally, you are guaranteed to have really bad situations in anything in life, but investing, especially once people are justifying, I shouldn't have to make money. I shouldn't have to invest well. What do you mean you shouldn't? The whole thing about investing is you have no protections. Just like with business, you are on your own. Caveat emptor. If you make bad decisions, that is how it works. If you don't want to be in a position of having to make decisions, then don't be in investments. And if you want to be a little bit in investments, but you want to be protected, then work with index funds and do nothing else and never discuss it, think about it, or watch the market. You have to stop being emotionally involved. Now, all of this, we've said about all this, we've shown definitively that gold and silver are currently inflated, that history shows they cannot make money, that anyone who says they are safe is lying. Anyone who says that they make money have increased is lying. They have not increased, they have decreased since 1980 and not by a little bit, by insane amounts. If you'd have bought historically, unless you got really lucky and bought at a severe low and are right now trying to sell, which is probably why people are doing this, right? There are people who bought lower than it is today and they're trying to convince more people to spend more money on gold and silver so that they can unload their bad investments as quickly as possible. They're desperate to get out. That is generally why people tell you that these are things that go in because they've already done it and they need you. It's called a fool's game, right? They need you to be willing to pay more than they were willing to pay so they can unload what they already know they're trapped with. And if you don't do it, they're stuck holding the hot potato investment. 
Now, all of this is looking at inflation. Inflation is not your actual baseline when you're talking about investing. This is talking about the hard amount of money you have. This is if I have $1 in 1980, will I have $1 today after adjusted for inflation, so the exact same buying power. But when we're talking about investing, the market, the stock market, creates value. And there's no need to have knowledge or anything when talking about creating that value. There is a baseline of that increase in, in economic power of businesses called, and there's multiple indexes for this, but the S&P 500 is the most generic one. That's the one that's generally looked at and used and the safest. If you look versus the S&P 500, that has not just matched inflation, but beats it by several percentage points every single year on average forever, for all history. It's not like gold and silver, which had a long period where they were controlled and we don't have numbers on them and since then have been super volatile and not made money. This is hundreds of years of consistent numbers that just keep making money. Now, when we talk about what they make year over year and we say, oh, it makes nine and a half percent, that has inflation built into it. So you have to subtract out inflation and adjust for that. So it takes a lot more work. But when you do that, when you treat it the same as you treat uh, gold and silver, what you see instead of is you still see spikes, you still see things going all over, but you see a consistent growth. If you'd have taken that same money and invested in stocks at any point along this continuum, any time, then you would have gained money and you would know that in the future you would continue to gain money and your base, every single piece would just keep growing. But with gold and silver, it cannot grow. You're stuck with the amount. So this is important. If you buy 100 ounces of gold, that's a good amount of money. You buy 100 ounces of gold or 100 ounces of silver today and it's worth X amount of dollars. In 100 years, you still have 100 ounces of gold. It doesn't get to be more gold. It doesn't grow, it doesn't change. It is just a block of gold, but there's risk. What if it was stolen? Right? What if someone you know, took a little bit of it? What if it was lost? What if it sunk on a ship? There are, uh, you, you have to pay to protect it during that time. There's losses associated with holding gold that people don't think about. There's actually cost to having it. So if you held gold for forever, eventually your money would be gone. That would take a really long time, especially if it's a lot of gold. Right? If you had 100 ounces of gold, you could reasonably expect it to take more than 1,000 years for it to erode to nothing, un unless it was stolen. But in general, it's going to erode. Your wealth will go away. Eventually, you, you have to use that gold to pay for the security to watch it, the place to store it, uh, all those different things. With stocks, you don't have those same problems. All of the protections are built into the, the price. Gold, they are not. So when we're looking, uh, over time, stocks get bigger and bigger. So if you had 100 shares of, let's say you invest in an in, in index S&P 500, you put that in, now you put it in for reinvestment. That means you're not pulling anything out every year. Of course, you could do that and that would change things, but you set it to be a set and forget, just like with the gold. The gold's not gonna pay you every year. It's not gonna pay you until you sell. Let's do the same thing with, with an index fund. You're gonna buy 100 shares today and you're gonna let that ride for 100 years. It's gonna be passed on to your children. They're going to inherit it and then they're gonna see what happens. The ones that you gave the gold to, you will have less gold than you started or they will have paid in to keep it there. That you can't, that would be cheating. So you have to assume that the gold, some of the gold has been taken out or will be charged to you at the end. And you'll find out how much of the gold has been lost for that. And they will only make or lose money based on the value of gold changing over time. But it's still selling 100 ounces of gold. And one can argue that gold is what we measure uh, um, inflation against. And so by some measures, the value that you put in will be the value you take out. It's not quite true with floating currencies. It doesn't exactly work that way, but it's going to be really close. But if they might get lucky. You may have a huge spike when they go to sell and they might make some money after waiting 100 years, but they also might lose money. So they may literally get less money than you paid for that gold after waiting 100 years without access to that money. With the stocks, yes, it is Theoretically possible to have a group of stocks that completely fail and all your money is lost. But realistically, that has never happened in history. That is not something you have to worry about. Those stocks are going to grow. Not only do they go up in value over time, but they also buy more stocks. This is the nature of this type of investment. Those 100 shares will at some point pay dividends, sometimes a tiny dividend, sometimes a giant dividend. Where do those dividends go? They, you're not taking money out, so they have to go somewhere. The only place they have to go is buying more stocks. 
So those 100 stocks over 100 years might turn into 200 stocks. And I don't mean because they split. I mean because the money from the 100 bought 100 more over time. And probably it would be much larger than that because over time it would buy a few and those few would keep also fueling uh, additional investment. You might have 500 at the end of 100 years rather than 100. And each one of those 500 should be expected to be very safely will be valued much higher than the value of each one you initially bought. So if you bought each one so for $100, you bought 100 shares for $100 each, you would expect at the end of 100 years that each share might be worth $1,000, but instead of having 100 shares, you may have 500 shares. And so at the end, you may have, you started with a value of 100 times 100, $10,000. And at the end, you may have a value of 500 times 1,000. Five million dollars, right? These are wildly different numbers. And these are not, while I didn't do strict math on that, these are really reasonable expectations of stock over that kind of period of time. You generally assume an index fund left on its own will double every 10 years. So in reality, the number I gave is incredibly conservative. If you put in $100 value of stocks today, you expect you'll probably have 200 in 10 years, that you'll have 400 in 20 years, you'll have 800 in, in 30 years, you'll have 1600 in 40 years, you'll have 3200 in 50 years. And you can see why that's a really powerful thing. That is, that is an assumed amount. That is a safe estimate of what your value is going to be over all of known market history, hundreds of years of markets. Gold, if you did the exact same thing, you would expect to pull out on average almost exactly what you put in. If you put in $100 now, at the end of 50 years, you'll have $100. That is a crazy difference. One would be expected to be 3,200, one still 100. One would be safely somewhere near 3,200. The other would be potentially higher, could be two or 300 for the gold, but it also could be 50 or 30. So you have a lot of risks. The one basically has no risk. The other has insane risks. When you compare them, one is absolutely reckless. It's like throwing your money away. And the thing about an index fund is that we use this as a baseline. If you have a good investment, it has to do better than an index fund because anybody can get into an index fund for no effort, no thought, no effort. Just, just put your money in and it's good. So that's what we use as a baseline because it's consistent and has been consistent for hundreds of years. It is the most consistent thing that we have. It is going to beat inflation because it grows, it produces things. So if you want to have a hedge, yes, in the momentary trading market, you may see that the uh, stock market has surged ahead. You want to dump while it's super high, buy gold while it's on the low side and wait weeks, months, maybe a year or two, and wait until they switch. When the stock market collapses, people panic, the stocks get really low, gold shoots up because they're being foolish and they go to gold at exactly the wrong time. You can take advantage of that, sell that gold and move back into the stock market. And as long as you do it quickly enough, the, the arbitrage difference can be greater than what would have been the growth of the stocks during the same time due to dividends. But it's difficult to do that, it is a risk, but that's where you can potentially make money. And that is what the rich know intrinsically because they study how markets work and the poor will never do because they look at it and act emotionally and go, well, I don't feel like that's what I wanna do, so I'm not going to do it. And that is how you lose all your money. When people say that the market is rigged, that the it's a scheme, there's a, it is anything but. It is super straightforward. Everything is presented to you. The information is widely public. And just don't listen to salespeople and scammers who are trying to take advantage of you because they need to get out of their bad positions or they're trying to make a quick buck. Logic, math, this stuff really shines through. Put in a little bit of effort, do your own research, think critically about how everything works and don't get emotional and don't think everyone's out to get you. Yes, people trying to sell you stuff, they're not out to get you, they're just trying to make money. But don't assume that the stock market is rigged. Don't assume that you can't make money. Those are things that people want you to think because they stop you from making good investments. And remember, the market, for all intents and purposes, it's not quite, but it's really close to a zero-sum game, which means it's like going to the casino. Yes, you want to win, but in order for you to win, someone else has to lose. Now, if you're dealing with gold, any kind of commodity, currency, stuff like that, that is absolutely true. There's a set amount and you have to make your wins off of someone else's losses. When you're dealing with stocks, they do increase in value over time. We can, in theory, all be winners. If everybody went into one giant pool of investment into the entire market and we all took even amounts just based on the amount we put in and we spread our money over the entire market, we would all win by a small amount. All of us. 
and it would give more power to the businesses as well. They would also win. But that's impossible to really do and would not be fair for other reasons and would cause some other problems. That's never going to happen. But in theory, there is the potential for everybody to be a winner in this type of scenario. So don't think that this is some huge scheme to defraud you. The stock market is there to protect you. There are tons of protections for you there. It is a very logical thing. I worked on Wall Street. There's never any of those kinds of problems that people imagine. But people who want to keep you down are going to convince you that those things exist because that empowers them to make more money because they need to make you the loser so that they have a better chance of being the winner. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And as always, I will see all of you tomorrow.